from St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. You know, I even did a full dance number that I had uh, choreographed with the help of another inmate. It, it's kind of taboo to see, um, you know, grown men um, act, you know, um, and just be free enough in their minds to be able to um, be get creative and, you know, and use improv. And this is the first time, I'm sure that it was done, that a man danced in prison in front of all other men. <laughs> not, not a lot of choreography you know, or dancing in prison. I mean, three and a half minutes, I'm getting it. I'm like, I'm like Chris Brown in there. I'm Jeremy Goodwin. On July 6th, the Black Rep opens its St. Louis production of Don Trell, Who Kissed the Sea. The play follows Don Trell, a young black man who embarks on a dreamlike journey into the past. The play is particularly meaningful for one of its St. Louis actors, Elijah Juan Davis. Davis played the lead role when it opened last fall in a co-production with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And at the time, he was barely a year out of federal prison, where he served six years for his role in an alleged bomb plot during the Ferguson protests of 2014. In June, producer Danny Wistenkowski interviewed Elijah Wan about his unusual return to the theater. Also joining the conversation was Ron Himes. He's the founder of the Black Rep and the director of Don Trell, Who Kissed the Sea. Danny started by asking Elijah Wan to describe a moment in 2014 when he felt his life take a difficult turn. At that time in my life, I was really searching for my identity, you know, trying to figure out who I was in the grand scheme of things. And figuring out which role that I would play <laughs> in this thing called life. And that ended up putting me in a position where I, most of the time I went off others' expectations of me rather than what resonated truly with my soul. Right. And, you know, during this time you were living in Ferguson. You were living yes. there during the death of Michael Brown when those protests broke out during that police killing. And this affected you greatly. Where did that moment take you? Well, it... It was a pain that I had felt before, you know, after going to college and, and studying history and, and constantly seeing um, individuals who look like me be sl being slain and shot down in the street uh, or assassinated for trying to make a difference in their community. So it was just a, a another mark, another blow to my esteem and to my spirit. And things just really took a turn when it happened right in my own backyard. <laughs> Yeah, and, and there was a lot going on in your life, but what eventually occurred is that you joined an organization called the New Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. uh, you also considered yourself what's known as a sovereign citizen, and, and these were pretty intense beliefs. And this brought you in contact with a couple people who you later learned were FBI informants. What happened uh, before uh, that led to your arrest? Uh, well, those changes, you know, in my beliefs and, you know, me kind of um, just subscribing to those different things, again, was about searching for uh, power, trying to search for some confidence, you know, and um, a, a way out, if you will. Um, and eventually, you know, that, like you said, that did lead me to meeting these individuals who I assumed were, um, you know, my friends or allies in this, in this struggle. However, uh, they were actors, you know, working for the federal government with the sole intent to um, steer my life in a direction that um, would not be productive for me and would lend to me uh, going to federal prison. Yeah. And, and you when you pleaded guilty, you know, the details that came out involved, you know, these informants who you thought were your friends, who you thought were members of this new Black Panther Party, you know, involved in buying a pipe bomb, what mm -hmm. you thought was a pipe bomb. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing, as you say, was staged by the FBI. The bomb wasn't real. The informants were being paid. Yes. And I wanted to ask a question of you, Ron. You know, you had known Olajuwon uh, when he was a young actor. You had directed him in a production at the Black Rep. And then you see his name involved in, in this news story. H how did that impact you? Uh, I couldn't believe it. I mean, and uh, to hear the charges... Uh, it was not the Elijah Juan Davis who I had known, who I knew, who I worked with, you know, who was a very positive 
a uh, young man who was, you know, very, very committed to his uh, self-worth and self, um, self-survival, self really. And so I just, it was unbelievable when I heard it. And, and you had worked, you know, you directed Alain in a previous play when Alain was 15 years old. What, what stood out to you or what, what uh, stayed with you uh, that made you want to follow his career uh, after that? Well, during that time, we actually had a very tight group of young people who had been with us probably, most of them had been with us five or six years uh, coming to our intensive summer program and then coming back to classes on Saturdays during the school year. And they had really bonded and become a really, really tight ensemble. And so that was what actually led us to considering doing the production of Serafina, which was about the young students in South Africa and their fight against apartheid. And so in the process of teaching them theater, we were also teaching them about social justice. We were also teaching them about their rights as young people. And we were teaching them about the oppression that young people like them were enduring in South Africa. And so I think that in the process of, you know, teaching them theater and teaching them art, we were also politicizing them and hopefully preparing them to be able to go out to be change agents themselves. And Alajuan, your identities Mm -hmm. in the Black Panther Party, in Sovereign Citizen, these weren't necessarily political ideas. And if you could, I know they're they're ideologies that don't always have easy definitions. But mm-hmm. if you had to explain, what did you believe at the time, and and what did you believe about you know your role in those organizations? Well, honestly, I, I can't say that I subscribe to every particular belief or tenet that each organization had. Um, however, what resonated with me most was um, the idea of uplifting fallen humanity, um, speaking for those who have been downtrodden, those who are, are oppressed. Uh, and it l- directly links back to my uh, um, participation in the production of Serafina. Um, Ron, and I've shared this with him, like Serafina really inspired me. You know, I had no idea about the international struggle of melanated people. So to be exposed to that, you know, from that point forward, I always made it um, an, an objective to try to speak to the speak those truths and and use utilize my talents and skills to um, be a change agent. And and Elajuan, though your you know those in, intentions that you had, you know this knowledge you were gaining, when you look back on the path that you did take mm-hmm. you know, during the Ferguson protests and during really these brief months when you were, you know, being worked by these FBI informants, yes. looking back on that. You know, does it feel like you went wrong somewhere? And, and how did you get out of that path? Well, I would definitely say that I was overzealous. Um, you know, I gave my loyalty and time to individuals and organizations that really, truly went in full in, in alignment with my purpose. You know, so once I got in those organizations and I did not see any um, firm leadership, I felt it was my obligation to try to stand up and, and be the greatest example in in those instances and uh that unfortunately made me a target it it unfortunately um made me someone who was considered a threat by the fbi we are talking to elijah davis and ron himes about the black rep staging of the play don trail lucas the sea which opens july 6. elijah i wanted to ask you about some of the the accusations that were made by the federal prosecutors Mm -hmm. and i think briefly though They accused you of planning a violent act, of using a pipe bomb, purchasing it, planning to use it against government officials. But during the entire time, uh, these informants were giving you money. They were giving you these plans. Mm -hmm. Um, The bomb wasn't real. uh, But in the evidence, in the transcripts they came out with, you seem to want to use these in some way. Did you intend violence in that plan or, or was it an act? Um, I had no intentions of committing any acts of violence. Um, unfortunately, the way the criminal justice system works often is that um, there is a, a threat initially after an indictment comes down, um, um, a threat of so many years. And, and in fact, I was threatened with 30 years in prison, uh, minimum, um, if I did not take the plea agreement. So um, with some direction from my elders and, you know, and my intuition, I 
move forward with the plea agreement um, so that I can be here today, essentially, you know. And uh, but there was never no intent to um, commit acts of, uh, you know, violence, anything, you know. And um, it, I, I essentially fell for the trap. Right. Now, Ron, I wanted to ask you that when Olajuwon was released from prison in 2020, what, uh, how did you connect with him, and, and what made you think that it was time to, to give this young man, you know, who had gone through this experience, a, a chance to reenter the stage in theater? Well, I had sort of kept up with Olajuwon while he was incarcerated, and um, we hadn't communicated directly, but I, someone who was commu- in constant contact with him was sort of my contact with him. And so I was always checking on him, checking in, seeing that he was okay. And uh, as soon as he was released, he reached out to me, and I told him that, you know, his place was still here with me. His place was still here at the Black Rep, and that, you know, when he was ready to come back, we could start working again. And, you know, we did. We picked up as though it was yesterday, the last time I had seen him. And uh, as soon as a project came up, which in this instance was Don Trill, Who Kissed the Sea at the Nebraska Rep, I reached out to him to see if he would be able to travel because, you know, that was a restriction upon him. And uh, we were able to get that cleared and he was able to travel. And we took him to Nebraska, to Lincoln, Nebraska to play the lead role of Don Trail in this wonderful, wonderful story, Don Trail Who Kissed the Sea. And Ron, tell me a bit about the the plot and and the framing of this play, which, uh, you know, as I described, uh, you know, a blend of poetry, humor, wordplay, ritual. It it goes to a lot of places. Give us a sense of what it's, uh, where it goes. Yeah, well, the play is written by Nathan Allen Davis, who was another young man who I met while he was uh, in his master's program at Indiana University. I was there directing another play, and they were doing a reading of his thesis project, which was Don Trail Who Kissed the Sea. So uh, I kept up with the play and followed it. And when I had an opportunity to offer it to the Nebraska Rep as a project for us to work on together, they jumped at it. And when uh, Lajeron reached out to me, I knew that this was uh, a perfect role for him if we could make it work. So Don Trail is a young man who has just graduated from high school. Very, very bright. He's got a full scholarship to Johns Hopkins University. But he's been troubled by these nightmares that he's been having. He's been dreaming of one of his ancestors who are having a recurring dream about this ancestor who refused to make the journey across the Atlantic Ocean on the slave ship. And at some point in that journey, jumped overboard and jumped into the Atlantic Ocean and sunk. Don Trail has been obsessed since he's been having this dream with going to find the spot where his ancestor jumped into the ocean. And his plan is to find that spot and to go into the ocean to reconnect with his ancestor. And, and of course, in, in the course of this journey, he encounters elders, he encounters dreams. There's, there's so much more than the, the physical um, you know, journey he's taking. It, it really goes places. Oh, yeah, it does. I mean, and, and Nathan has done a tremendous job of crafting the story. So, you know, his family is, of course, very, very excited about him receiving this full scholarship. But there's been a history in his family, particularly with the men who have always been connected to their roots and have always tried to find a way to reconnect to their roots and to their uh, elders and their ancestors. And Don Trail has come of age where it is his turn. You know, his father dealt with it. His grandfather dealt with it. You know, his mother talks about the men in the family having this, you know, when it seems like everything's going right, they make a left turn. And so at the point when all she wants is for Don Trail to head off to campus, he has changed his plans. He has a, a cousin who works at the aquarium. He goes to talk to her to get information about how to scuba dive and to get scuba diving equipment. He has his homeboy who he hangs out with all the time, who he's trying to make him understand his plan. But then he meets his soulmate, a young lady named Erica. 
And Erica is his soulmate, and she really, really supports him, supports his vision, supports his dream, and helps him to put himself in a place to be able to go after it. Sure, sure. And, and of course, you know, for those who want to see what learn what happens in that journey, they should, uh, you know, check out the production on July 6th opening. And Elajuan, you got a chance to play Dontrell, who sounds like he maybe was going through a lot of the things that you were at that age. Mm -hmm. What did you see in that character and, and being that character? It was refreshing to be able to step in the role of Dontrell, um, be, very much so because we shared a lot of parallels. You know, and um, this idea of uh, being somewhat of the golden child or the, the prize for the family, everybody has high hopes for, and then a left turn is taken. And my life mirrored that, you know. I could have easily um, remained in college and, and remained on the dean's list and just took that journey and went all the way. Um, however, um, I, too, have had dreams I, too, have been uh, inspired and moved by my connection to my ancestors. And, and that shakes you up. And a lot of times it doesn't make sense to those around you. And, in, and sometimes it didn't make sense to me. Um, but I made those decisions, and um, I'm blessed to be still here today um, and, and living to tell it after that turn was taken. You know, but I feel like I'm back on the path that was uh, destined for me. And it is here um with the black rep, it is here in, in the arts and utilizing the gifts that I've been given. And Elijah One, it, when the play opened, you, you played Don Trell, the, the name character. But when the play opens here in St. Louis, you'll be yeah. playing his father. How, how different is that going to be for you? <laughs> it's, it's like going full circle, you know. Um, in Nebraska, it, like, you, you use the word ritual. And... For me, that's exactly what uh, Don Trail in Nebraska was. I was, I was able to be uh, reminded that I am carried and I am supported by my ancestors. And then to be back here in St. Louis and playing the father who is the ancestor, and you know, it's very magical, esoteric. It's an amazing experience, and I'm I'm able to see it from both perspectives. And I think that is a, a privilege that most people don't come by. And I'm so grateful for Ryan for continuing to provide these opportunities for me. We're talking to Olajuwon Davis and Ron Himes about the Black Rep's staging of the play Dontrell Who Kissed the Sea, which opens July 6th. Ron, tell me about the decision to cast Olajuwon both as the title role of this production and then to make him that character's father in another <laughs> one. Is that is that uncommon? Why would you do that to an actor like this? <laughs> Well, you know, this has been uh, a very, very different last two years that we've all lived through. So this production was originally scheduled to go up in January, and we had been in rehearsal, and uh, I had talked to Elijah Wan while we were in Nebraska um, about, you know, being vaccinated and getting vaccinated and mm -hmm. that, you know, Nebraska was a little more lax than... Missouri was and that the uh, our contract with the actors union here would allow and um, when we came back he had waited too late to get vaccinated and so was we were not able to use him in the production mm -hmm. and so we had to replace him as Don Trail in January and the whole cast had come back from Nebraska and so we just had to put a new Don Trail into that company. Well, Omicron came along and closed the production in January. We were fortunate enough that we were able to have the show postponed and got the July dates yes. in place. However, when we got the July dates, the actor Karamu Kush, who was playing the father in Nebraska and was here in January ready to play the role, is now unavailable because he's shooting his uh, first big feature film. And so I thought... This is great. Elijah Wan <laughs> is vaccinated now. He's just done the production of Jitney, which was the last black rep production. And I'm like, hey, you know, what do you think about playing the father this time around? And uh, he was excited about it. I was excited about it. I thought it was another way to stretch him as a young artist. And uh, we're having fun doing that now. 
Yeah, it, I mean, it's it's amazing. You know, you bring up Jitney, which Alangewan. This is now going to be your second production uh, with the Black Rep yeah. in St. Louis. Yes. And in Jitney, you also play a young black man who is you know feeling the tensions of the society around him mm-hmm. and his own reactions to it. Uh, what kind of ties are you finding in these characters as as you inhabit them? And you know, I'm starting to believe that the roles pick me. You know, you know, and and my participation in Jitney and then down trail well you know I can identify with young blood too you know I, I was a young father trying to raise a family you know um, feeling the pressures of society and what I perceived as you know uh, you know white supremacy and you know um, all of those unseen forces unseen forces and so you know I could I could go there it was it wasn't very hard for me to identify with that and draw from experience to uh, bring that character to life Alajwan, before Jitney, the last time you were in a theater company was actually in a federal prison in Michigan, Mm -hmm. where you joined this theater program and you performed in stages that really weren't more than some chairs in an area in the corner of a cell block. How different is that experience of performing in a prison to getting out on stage in front of an audience? Um, It's not very different, but what is different is that the the audience, you know... um, uh, male prisoners, you know, prison is a very rigid place, and so it's not a place where expression is is applauded. So it, it's kind of taboo to see, um, you know, grown men um, act, you know, uh, and just be free enough in their minds to be able to um, be creative and you know and use improv, and so. I was very much um, given the opportunity to shake things up in there. You know, I even did a full performance uh, dance number that I had uh, choreographed with the help of another inmate. And this is the first time that I'm sure that it was done, that of, of that a, a man danced in prison in front of all other <laughs> not, men. Not a lot of choreography you know, or dance numbers I mean, in prison. I mean, three and a half minutes, I'm getting it. I'm like, I'm like Chris Brown in there, you know, but... What I and our spirit moved me to do that, you know, and that was my gift to that environment. It's like it's okay to be, it's okay to express yourself, and the arts will continue to be a form of empowerment for anybody who may be in prison, whether that's physically or most importantly mentally. And and when Dontrell, who kissed the sea, opened in uh, Nebraska, was that the first time that you had stepped out onto that stage to see an audience in you know? Since before going to prison? That's correct. Wow. What, what was that moment like for you? You know, it was affirming, you know, and then to be Don Trail, that role, it was so affirming to be carried and, and, and supported by the ancestors both on the stage. But for me, you know, it felt very literal because everything that I envisioned and all the things that were promised to me while I was in prison in my dreams had become reality not long after I had been released from prison and despite all the obstacles and odds and, and, you know, Ron, I'm confident that, you know, he serves a very important role in my journey. He has always served that role. And I'm so grateful that, you know, spirit is utilizing him, you know, to help me get back um, on my, you know, my path of destiny, (laughs) essentially. And I mean, I can't express enough how grateful I am to be here. Lajuan, where do things go for you from here? Well, um, I imagine that they will continue to, uh, I will continue to be involved in the arts. Um, uh, for me, I'm going to do some more writing and um, and try to take my experiences and, and um, create stories and narratives that will help um, others who may have experienced things like me. And inspire others you know that's that's the objective is to lift uplift and inspire you know thank you olajuwon thank you so much for being here ron himes founder and director of the black rep thank you for joining us thank you for having thank you for having us this episode was produced by danny wisentowski with audio engineering by aaron Dorr. our production intern is avery rogers alex hoyer is our executive producer podcast proudly supports St. Louis artists by using music from Life Creative Group.
St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.